When I look at Trudeau, there's a couple of things that I see. I see someone who hasn't grown up. I mean, one of the most appalling things about the budget, as far as I was concerned, is that it provides ample evidence, if such was not sufficiently provided already, that Trudeau is exactly what you would be afraid of if you were afraid of him. He, he, he doesn't have an answer to a problem that isn't overwhelmingly predictable ideologically. It's like you don't even need him. You just have to run the ideology. It has the answers. What's the big problem? Equity between men and women. It's like, sorry, that's not the big problem. That's not even, you're not even scratching the surface of the problem with that approach. And your solutions? It's like, you can learn those solutions your first week in women's studies. They're not solutions. They're the sorts of solutions that children toy with when they have no idea what they're contending with. Yeah, well, there's, there's not a lot there, I'm afraid. It's Fixing these complex systems is unbelievably complicated, and you're likely to make them worse when you're mucking about with them haphazardly, right? And so it's way easier just to do this. This he, Trudeau said it back in, wasn't it 2016? Why do we have half, why are half the cabinet women? Because it's 2000, and, was it 16 or 15? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's almost impossible to overstate how shallow that comment is and how not only shallow, but it's also casually malevolent in an unconscious sense because he had a job to do, which was to evaluate his MPs thoroughly and skeptically and pick the best people, period. But that isn't what he did. He said, oh, well, it's, it's 2016, so I'll appoint half women. It's like, well, that everybody gave him a pass on that, and so here we are. Now we have a budget that's equity-focused. Yeah, well... Good luck with that. When I look at Trudeau, there's a couple of things that I see. I see someone who hasn't grown up. So he's Peter Pan. I see someone who's, he knows how to behave in public. That's one thing you can say about him. He's got that, that easy charisma and charm that comes from being good looking, being from a, from a, from a, a from, from a favored background, his, the favored background that he's from. He's got buy on, he's got buy on that. And the reason I believe that is because I don't believe that if he had any true character that he would have run because he ran on the strength of his name and he hadn't earned the right to do that. But people elected him, so here we are. And this is what we get. I mean, he, he, he pulled out the ideological card when he formulated the cabinet and Canadians all went, oh, isn't that cute? It's like, no. Hmm. Um, how can you... Uh, how can an individual change without falling into chaos? Well, part of it is that you don't want to bite off more than you can chew. You know, you should try to change something that is difficult, but where you have a moderate probability of succeeding. Or if you're feeling depressed and anxious, a fairly high probability of succeeding. So you have to, it's just as if you're dealing with a child, let's say. When you want to foster the development of a child, you set them a new task so that their skills expand. You don't want it to be so difficult that their probability of failure is overwhelming. There's no utility in that. But you don't want it to be so easy that they can already do it, right? And that it's also partly you don't want it to be so easy because there's no intrinsic joy of mastery in mastering a task that's too easy. So if you calibrate it properly, then you get to have your cake and eat it too, right? Because the skill expands. That's called the zone of proximal development. That was discovered by a, a, a Russian psychologist named Vygotsky. He was a very good psychologist. And one of the things he noted was that parents, adults, automatically talk to children at a level that slightly exceeds their current comprehension ability. We do that without, we don't have to be taught to do that. We do that automatically. And obviously, we'd have to do that because otherwise children would learn how to talk. But you want to have yourself in the zone of proximal development all the time, really. Well, maybe not when you're relaxing, you know, but generally you want to be in a place that you've reasonably well mastered while at the same time extending your skills. It's optimal because then things are under control and turning out the way you need and want them to, but your ability to master new areas is also growing. And I would say that's associated with people's intrinsic sense of meaning. Now, the meaning is a real instinct, as far as I can tell, neurologically speaking, and it signals that not only are you somewhere that's working, but that you're getting better at the same time. So that's what an athlete does when, when he or she pushes past a limit, you know. You don't want to hurt yourself, obviously, but you don't want to 
you don't want to just stay and you don't want to you don't want to hurt yourself and you don't want to be somewhere where you're completely incompetent you want to be somewhere secure but challenging and that's what makes your life meaningful and but perhaps that's an antidote to modern parenting that you're proposing a, a lot of you you talk in the book about how happiness is is not a a, a reasonable goal not not a, a, a it's a shallow goal, goal because well the problem with happiness is that you're there's lots of times you're not going to be happy I mean life is hard you don't have to scratch this is one thing you learn as a clinical psychologist very rapidly but I think people know this anyways you don't have to scratch very far below the surface in most people's lives to find a pretty damn deep well of tragedy and not only tragedy but often malevolence sometimes on their part but also but sometimes because they've been subject to betrayal and and abuse and 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 scandal and all sorts of things and there's virtually no one who doesn't have that deeply embedded into their narrative it's like happiness doesn't address that you know, you need a reason to keep you going when things are falling apart around you because there's going to be a lot of your life where, you know, you have a sick parent or you have a sick child or you're not, your health isn't good yourself or your marriage is unstable at the moment or you're dealing with a financial crisis or like it's just one thing after another. Everyone knows this. And so meaning is a much more robust antidote than happiness. Happiness is great, man. If it comes along, it's like welcome it, you know. And, and be grateful for it, but it's a side effect and not a goal. Can I ask about so, why the 12 rules? You mentioned that, that you had started helping people online. Um, I think you wrap up the book by saying you, you hope that it, this is useful to people. Mm -hmm. Your book is is uh, topping on the Amazon charts. You Your audiences are quite large. You, your New York Times doesn't approve of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, then, but, but yep. others do. And yep. um, so what was your purpose? What was your goal in this book? Well, I'll tell you a story. So I was in L.A. three weeks ago, and um, I had given a talk there, and I was walking down the street um, the next day, and this kid pulled up beside me in a car and hopped out, and he was a Latino kid, probably 19 or 20. He popped over, and he was all happy to see me and sort of bounced around and said that he'd been listening to my lectures a lot. And then he said, you know, it's really straightened out my relationship with my dad, really a lot. And then he said, just wait a minute, wait a minute. And then he ran back to the car, and he got his dad out. And then they stood there, and like they had their arms around each other. And, well, they were both extremely happy. You know, they'd they'd repaired the relationship. Well, that's the purpose. It's like when I go places now with, and people come to talk to me. That happens all the time. It's like that's great. I used to couldn't be couldn't be better. That's so good. It was so fun to see that, you know, and they were genuine about it. So, yeah, that's really good. Are you surprised by that? When you wrote it and sat down to write it, did you envision that you would be getting that type of reaction and this type of response? Well, not certainly not at this scale. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I had taught this course called Maps of Meaning, which was based on my first book, and it also had an influence on my personality course. And I got a lot of student feedback on that course. You know, I've been teaching it since 1993, and the vast majority of the feedback was, this course changed my life. And I knew that I was dealing with things that were fundamental. I was aiming to deal with things that were fundamental. You know, I'm aiming to deal with tragedy and malevolence, and those are fundamental. And so I knew that and, you know, the, the work that I've done incorporates a lot of the wisdom of some of the greatest thinkers of the 19th and 20th century, the clinicians in particular. There were some great clinicians in the 20th century, you know, like there's a dozen of them probably, maybe maybe more. And a lot of what they learned is really helpful. Like you, if you read, like Carl Rogers is a good example. I talk about him in uh, Chapter 9, Rule 9, which is assume that the person that you're listening to knows something you don't. And... There's very practical advice out there in how to conduct a conversation with your, an intimate partner. You know, and one of the rules is, well, listen, because would you want to have the same damn argument for the rest of your life? It's like, listen, you're not there to win the argument, because you have to live with that person. So winning is a really bad strategy. Peace is a good strategy. Well, so you listen to them, and then you tell them back what they said. And if they agree with you, well, then you've got it. At least they know you've heard them. That's something. And it also stops you from being able to turn them into a straw man. And, you know, if you really do it intelligently, you know, maybe you happen to be a better 
better verbally than your partner. It doesn't mean you're right. It just means you're better verbally. And so if they've got something to tell you, well, then maybe you also have to help them restate their argument so that it's even stronger. You think, well, why in the world would I do that? And the answer is, well, you've got a lot of days coming up, and maybe you don't want to have the same fight every day. You know, I had a client at one point who was spending about 45 minutes a night putting his, uh, his son to sleep, four, four years old, something like that. And this is very common. And we did a little bit of arithmetic. I do often do that with my clients. It's like, okay, let's call that five hours a week, 20 hours a month, uh, 240 hours a year. That's six work weeks of time in a year you're spending fighting with your son. It's like, what do you expect from that? You're not going to like each other. You can't fight with someone six work weeks in a year and not have that hurt both of you. It's like you've got to solve it. You've got to figure out what the problem is. You've got to make it go away. So one of the things that it's hard for people to, to grasp conceptually is that the mundane things that you do every day are your life. And you want to get those right. And, and people don't pay attention to those things. They're usually looking for the exceptions like the vacation or the special occasion. It's like, uh-uh. You want, you want to figure out how when you come home people greet you so that you're welcome in your own house. Because you do that like three times a day. You get that down, it's like that's 45 minutes of each day. That's like 10% of your life right there. You fix that, it's 10% of your life. Meal times, things you repeat. You want to get those pristine. And, and that Carl Jung said that people in the modern world don't see God because they don't look low enough, which is such, he's so brilliant, such a brilliant idea. But it has to do with this willingness to contend with the hypothetically mundane realities of day-to-day -day life. Whatever happens day-to-day -day is not mundane.